everybody who's here, thank you for joining us today. We are talking about the 2022 cloud report. Um, all the data that didn't fit into it, a bunch of the data that did fit into it. And uh, we've got the people who know the most about that. So my name is Charlie. Uh, I'm a senior technical content marketer at Cockroach Labs. We have Keith McClellan, who's the director of partner solutions engineering at Cockroach, the lead author of the report, um, who has been in, in the trenches of this report for what, a year now, <laughs> probably literally a full year at this point. Um, and we're also lucky enough to have Jeff Moon, who's the senior director of software system design at AMD, um, which is really exciting. So he's gonna be able to, to bring some insights in about some of the stuff that we found in this year's report, um, comparing the performance of, of AMD and Intel across some of these instances. Um, so with that, I guess, Keith, I, I wanna start with you and it probably makes sense to just kind of kick this off by talking about what is the cloud report? Um, could you just walk us through like what we tested, what were the kind of, what were the different benchmarks that we looked at and a little bit about how we approach that? Yeah, so, so for the folks on the line who aren't familiar with Cockroach TV, we're a distributed SQL database that is natively multi-site and multi-cloud. So we can have a single database cluster running across all three cloud providers simultaneously if we want fully synchronous, all that stuff. Uh, happy to point you at a bunch of references, including some webinars I've been on with uh, some of uh, Charlie's coworkers uh, talking about that. But um, one of the things that's really important for running CockroachDB across the cloud providers is knowing what configurations of servers give us roughly the same performance across all the three cloud providers. And so we started doing this effort. I think this is our fourth cloud report that we've done um, because we realized we just didn't know. And, and the insight that came early on was that most people didn't know what was relatively comparable across the different cloud providers. And so we decided we wanted to publish that information and make it available to folks for, for making decisions. Um, we are using CockroachDB as the substrate, largely. Um, what, what that means is we're using the database to benchmark the infrastructure, not the other way around, right? So our goal was to configure a, uh, have a common configuration of CockroachDB across all of the different providers as consistent as we possibly could make it so that the numbers were, were as comparable as possible. We also did micro benchmarks on storage, network, and um, CPU as well, um, which were really interesting uh, pieces of information that help us understand kind of part of the why of, of, of why certain instances might be better suited for running CockroachDB than others. Okay, that's great. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe just to sort of give people some context about how deep we dig into this. Could you tell us a little bit about the process? I mean, we were just talking about how it's been a year, um, but, but this really is kind of a lengthy and involved thing. Could you just talk about like how, how deep we went this year on it? Yeah, so this year we focused on a couple of new fundamental questions. The, the first one was, would we be better off using more smaller nodes or fewer bigger nodes for a cockroach to be deployment uh, based on the configuration and the benchmark we were setting up? We, we found some interesting results there that we could talk a little bit about. Um, the other thing that we did was we just kind of turned up the volume on all of on all the different tests. So one of the, the key pieces of feedback we got last year was it was hard to know how significant the results were based on, on the number of runs and, and kind of the varying different configurations we were testing. And so we increased the number of, of benchmark runs. So we ran over 30, almost 3,600 database benchmark iterations plus all the micro benchmarks. Uh, so that we could generate statistics so that we would know the statistical significance of, of between runs, right? Um, because one of the things that's really hard for us to determine is when you have very, very small differences in performance, which in a lot of cases, that's what we found between the cloud providers this year. Um, what, what is actually a significant thing or what, what is just something that, you know, you might've seen regardless of the run, like, because, if you run the same benchmark five times, you might get a variation of a couple of percentage points. The, the variation across the entire test 
all of the configurations was 1.4% this year. So, so that's a, that's kind of this, the, um, what was it? The, uh, um, the margin of error for the entire report is 1.4%. So, so that told us a lot of stuff around cost per transaction, things like the actual raw performance numbers, were they, were they statistically significant or not when we saw relatively small variations between instance types, those types of things. Um, so those were the kind of the big focuses of the report this year. Did that cover everything you were looking for there, Charlie? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good summary. And of course, um, the report is out there and it's free. So if anybody uh, wants to know all the nitty gritty details, they're in there. So go download it. Uh, but we won't we won't dive into any of that stuff further right now because we've got um, some more interesting stuff to get to. So let's jump right to one of the most interesting top level findings because one of the things that we do or that we've done in the cloud report every year is compare instances that are using AMD processors and instances that are using Intel processors. Um, and we've seen different things in different years and we saw something uh, new and exciting and different this year. So I guess, yeah, Keith, let's, uh, let's dive into that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so in past years, uh, particularly the, the previous year's report, we saw that the AMD previous generation Epic processors were were very comparable to Cascade Lake, which is an Intel processor platform, kind of across the board for, um, for raw CPU performance and for price per transaction. Um, but it wasn't faster for the, the raw database benchmarks in past years. What we found with this year's report, we tested the, the latest generation instance types. So these are all third generation Epic, which I guess is codenamed Milan. You can correct me if I'm wrong there, Jeff. That's correct, um, yep. And, um, and AMD just was faster across the board um, for both the database and the CPU benchmarks, which was really interesting insight because I think the last time that AMD was this had this much performance dominance over kind of the the available Intel platforms, I was I was still in high school and I was building <laughs> computers for my family, so. Um, so, and that's really great because not only is it raw performance, it's price performance as well, which is really significant. Um, and the performance was extremely consistent across the three providers as well, which meant that you could, given the, the constraints of, of a particular application, get very consistent performance on an AMD platform across all three clouds, which is really awesome. Um, the, the other kind of really interesting insight that definitely ties into this was around whether or not we should run more smaller nodes or fewer bigger nodes. So one of the advantages of being a distributed SQL database is rather than having to scale up and get the biggest, biggest nodes possible, we can, we can scale out. And so we did some, a lot of work to determine whether or not we should be using more smaller nodes or fewer bigger nodes. And while there are caveats, right, for any given workload, you should absolutely test. It seems like you should start with the assumption that more smaller nodes is going to be as performant, if not more performant for running a workload like CockroachDB. And largely that seems to be because the average clock frequency for the smaller instances was five to 6% faster on the smaller nodes. And we have some um, hypotheses on, on why that is around thermal load and whatnot. Um, but really excited to have Jeff on the, the call here because while I can talk about what we saw and what we think happened, hopefully he can actually tell us, for example, why T2D was so much faster than all of the other um, uh, AMD instances are running the same platform, our processor platform, and maybe uh, shine a little light on kind of why the smaller nodes were running at slightly higher uh, clock frequency over the course of our, our benchmarks than the bigger nodes. So um, so with that, Charlie, was there was there anything else that you were you were hoping I would dig into there? No, I think that's a good start. Um, but so I was going to say, yeah, let Jeff, let's go over to you then. I guess um, how 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 did you do this? And and yeah, I think we really particularly would like to know about that T2D node and why, um, yeah, why that was so performative. If you have any insight there. 
Yeah, I'd say first uh, as a first touch point, uh, as we start working through all the kinds of benchmarks and you guys have gone through so many different variations and, and triangulated to sort of the, the lower bite size uh, t-shirt sizes here and seeing, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, benefit around that. And as customers sort of, you know, traverse this, this large landscape uh, across all these providers and which makes the most sense as Keith sort of articulated, hey, it's really, um, you know, you, you test your workload, test your application, you know, and you have to look at a lot of different variances around, um, you know, your price performance and your dial, right? Sometimes you need your insights quicker. You're, you may dial it a certain way or you need the, um, you know, the less performance, but lower the price or both, you know, so you find that balance, right? So it's, it's everything in there. So now to, to your next question is, you know, the highlight reel, right? The, the TTD was kind of the, the big, uh, the big one through the report that you were, you were talking about. And there really is sort of that, as you're saying, you, you see a lot of that sort of scale out in, I'll reference your um, uh, your report. I think it was like pages seven through nine, and it talked about sort of that uh, was it the core mark or something like that. And really, what we're seeing is so there was TTD and N2D, um, and you know one was threaded, you know SMT on, which was the N2D, and threads meaning SMT off was T2D. And that's where you're seeing the, that core performance at that price performance. And we're able to drive a lot more, uh, you know, with less resources, honestly. So, I mean, there was a lot of uh, pluses that came out of that uh, specific instance that uh, was quite a, um, uh, I'll say, uh, customers uh, I see uh, gravitating towards that for a variety of workloads uh, that, we're, that we've been seeing uh, across you know, either whether it be ISVs or internal properties or, um, you know, customers. So, I mean, it's, it's been, uh, that's really been the, the biggest takeaway uh, from, from the TTD, sort of an eye opening of why is that better? <laughs> so that, that, that was so the main reasoning. To translate that for some of the less technical people in the audience, is it correct to say that the N2D instances and probably largely most of the other AND instances we tested had a thread assigned to the virtual CPU, whereas T2D had a physical core assigned yes. to the, the vCPU. Is that is that an accurate way of describing? Um, that is accurate. We saw a performance difference? Yes, absolutely, yep. It, it'd be really great if you could maybe speculate on why we saw better performance across the board, regardless of, of which instance type far around um, the actual like instance performance for the smaller instances as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things. And I started talking about that a little bit of how you test and things like that. There's a, I, I usually talk about benchmarking with dimensional testing. So in other words, I step up vCPUs, I step up working set. Um, and, and those kind of things together start to draw your picture of why you why it would make sense on a smaller instance size, um, you know, you uh, the way the architecture set up or the NUMA across the CCD CCX, so you you have a straight line. Uh, it's all within you know um, you know the all across the 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 network. Sorry, the storage and the network and the memory bandwidth is is all aligned. You're going to see you know at the lower size. Um, I think, you know, from a TCO perspective, I think you'll see, you know, the best bang for your buck is what a lot of customers are seeing. Um, and, and that's why I said, it's not just a performance, it's, it's the price and that, that cost at the lower, uh, at the lower size, meaning less resource. So you can do that, uh, scale out. So that, that was kind of the reasonings behind it. Okay. That's great. <laughs> um, so, and Keith, I think you're, the other thing that that you were curious about that Jeff, I'm not sure if you have have any insight on is the the small versus large nodes and kind of like what's causing that difference behind the scenes. Is that is that something that um, that you have thoughts on? I mean, the smaller sizes um, have slightly more performance, is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I, and I think that was just saying you're, you know, you may be getting a lot less crosstalk, things like that across NUMA alignment. Like that's why I said the working set was really important and a bunch of other factors that, that would have you in, in the alignment to, to be the most performant at the smaller sizes based on that working set. Yeah. How exactly does, does that work? If, if you don't mind me asking. So we, we were controlling for NUMA nodes, right? So we threw out anything that had more than one NUMA node. Um, if, unless, unless it was an instance size that we just couldn't, there were some older generation servers that we just couldn't get provisioned with a single NUMA node, but um, what's kind of happening under the covers there that we might not be seeing in the VM that that could be impacting that performance on like the, the larger nodes? Yeah, um, depending on cloud provider A, A through B or C or D, <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's these NPS sort of settings that, that happen at the host level. Uh, and that basically is, is basically saying, how the memory is going to be interleaved uh, across the, the quadrants, right? To, to make the alignment. So if they're NPS one, it's across them all and NPS two, there's a subset and NPS four, it's like a, a, a smaller pairing. So, I mean, it depends on how the, um, how it was implemented at the host level uh, around that. Yeah. So, so there could be differences. Yeah. We struggled to try to, figure that out other than just saying, hey, if there's more than one NUMA node, we were, if it was possible to um, provision it with the single NUMA node, we would just destroy the instance and recreate it. But um, we struggled a bit to kind of determine why we still were seeing performance differences um, between runs potentially, right? Um, I would say, you know, we did a pretty good job of getting to like a reasonable window from a, like a, a reproducibility perspective. Um, but we definitely saw more performance differences between runs in the clouds, both for the small and the large instances than we would if we had kind of ran into bare metal server, right? Um, and so it would be, do you, do you have any kind of insight that you that you might be able to share around uh, why that might be the case or things that maybe we could have done better from a testing perspective to better control for this? Because that was one of the spots where we were, um, where we spent a lot of time, but aren't confident that we necessarily um, did everything as well as we could have. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway, and it is something uh, I look into myself is around sort of up-leveling some toolings to remove that sort of friction as you're talking about, um, to get those insights um, a lot easier and manageable. So that is that is something that uh, we're looking into for sure. Um, and that is um, around those alignments so that um, you'll know for sure what are all those metrics that make that real um, without going into and getting on a screen and showing you all the different uh, permutations um, that uh, you know folks do on, on in the deeper uh, Linux sort of forensics, uh, you can get to that answer. So I guess my really quick answer is honestly, um, there's some uh, more tooling that we can do to help that. Uh, there are some toolings I know on our AMD site that sort of help us uh, traverse some of those kind of concepts. Uh, but we will, um, you know, that I think that's a, a future conversation for sure. Um, and uh, I'm actually happy that you're saying that, which means I'm on target for what I was uh, <laughs> what I was looking for, right? Because it's it's great feedback, and it's also um, something uh, I've done on my own, and I've come to exactly where you were, and finally I was able to figure it out at the deep. Because I'm kind of a kernel guy anyway, so I kind of know where to where to traverse, and I'm sure all you guys have been in those spaces. But you know, architecture A, B, and C can be different, and you know, there's nuances to that. So I think there's some tooling that can up-level that to give that insight a little bit easier, but that, um, that's something uh, as a future discussion for sure. Yes, so, so one of the other things that we discovered other than at least for the threaded AMD instances, they all performed pretty consistently, at least for the short running tests, right? So yeah. Core Mark only runs for like 60 seconds, right? And it's so really small, the right? Ran, uh, the instances all ran like within, well within the margin of error and it was very reproducible for that. The database benchmarks, have more variation in them by by nature, by design, actually. Um, yeah. 
And are they're longer running, right? You know, they're 12 to 15 minutes for each run and we're running multiple iterations before we tear the instance down and a bunch of other stuff. Um, what, um, what, what actually kind of drives the, um, the ability for you all to have that kind of super consistent performance, right? Because we saw much greater variation um, with, uh, with the Intel processors. Um, yeah. so I just, um, just at an AMD level, like kind of what architectural things have you all done that made, um, made your performance so consistent in this kind of virtualized environment? Yeah, there was, um, you know, we talked certainly about the MPS settings, but there was, um, the one I was trying to remember, and that's why I'm writing it down, was certainly that re reduced latency uh, to memory, you know, in, in the latest architecture. And, and that kept a lot of consistency and just also more isolations between uh, the connections. And it, like I noticed personally, when I run a lot of my benchmarks and you run them n number of times, of course, before we we show those up. And typically, I don't see a lot of variation with uh, when we run uh, our systems, and I have seen it across uh, other variants. And to me, that that was, you know, um, a case to show why the architecture uh, keeps things sort of in, in isolation. Uh, it's, own, it's almost its own quality of service in some respects, right? But it, it does uh, certainly help uh, to that. And um, you know, it's just a lot of those uh, enhancements that they have um, they have gone through that have helped uh, sort of reduce. Um, so be more specifically, too, is in the report, for example, on the AWS side, and it's, of course, when the report was run, um, you know, we had another generation M6A that came out, and that would show uh, a much better stepping uh, as well. Uh, uplift quite significantly, depending on if a database, what have you. And um, there's a bunch of briefs that are up on our uh, on our site that I could uh, show you to to help yeah. um, see what that is. But anyway, um, it, it it we have a larger cache. We have um, you know more unified cache. That is, we have more isolation between our connections uh, from the memory out from the IOD dies, all that. So all of those together. Uh, coupled to um, lower variance, uh, lower latency, um, and a better result, in, which which obviously uh, ends up in your application uh, for consistency and more performance. Yeah. Yeah. So so one other kind of insight, and this was very clear in the database benchmarks, but it, we also saw some of this in the other in the micro benchmarks, including CoreMark um, instances that were provisioned with less memory had less consistent performance. It wasn't necessarily worse performance. So for example, N2D running the high CPU variant, which is a one-to-one -one configuration, um, had less consistent performance than N2D standard, um, even for the micro benchmarks. Is, uh, are you aware of any reason why that would, um, why, why that would be the case? Sorry to say it again. You're saying the, the N2D versus the TTD. So we had, yep. so no, for the, so, cause, so just looking at Google here, right. With N2D, they, yep. uh, they offer, they, they, they offer three standard shapes. Um, and we also get a custom shape. So they do, they have a high CPU, a standard, and then yep. a high map, right. And so gotcha. high CPU is a one gig of memory per vCPU. Uh, standard is four gigs of memory per vCPU, and then high mem is eight. So we saw very consistent performance characteristics if we were at standard or greater. Okay. Um, yes, but for the 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 one to one, and we also did a custom two to one test. Um, we saw less consistent performance, um, include not just on the database side, but we also saw it on on some of the micro benchmark side. Um, just curious if you had any kind of a speculation as to why that, that would be the case. No, I can't think of it off the top of my head and what that is without some of the data, uh, to analyze. Um, yeah, that's interesting. The, the one thing that we thought maybe was that we didn't do any Linux kernel tuning and we didn't tune swappiness. And we were wondering if maybe it was something like we were hitting the, we were swapping the disc a lot more often and we were tracking that, um, but I was wondering yeah, I mean, if you know, an architectural reason why why it would have been slower 
No, that's kind of where I, I usually would start to say it, it's most likely in the application to your point around some of the, the finer tunings. I usually look at your IO stats, et cetera, you know, the extended ones and start looking at uh, where some of that, those issues are, are coming through or the DM stats, et cetera. And from there, I usually can, can see where the, the problem space is. Um, but I, I can't see a reason why that would be a difference. That's why I'm like, that, that doesn't make sense to me, but um you know, wouldn't be the first time I, I have mistuned the application. Uh, and and uh, I'm, some fully, of the, uh, I'm fully willing to accept that it was just that we didn't, um, we deliberately didn't do separate tunings for different instance sizes. Um, because oh, we yeah, wanted, it removes the bias, right? Bias, we I just, mean, for all we just didn't, yeah. The only other alternative would have been to do individual tunings for every single configuration. We had 127 of them, something like that. It would have been a lot. You wanted to finish it within the year, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it would have been, yeah, it would have been even more time consuming to to do custom tuning for each instance type, right? So, um, yeah. So it was just curious if that was something, um, something that that you had an opinion on. Architecturally, no, I'm not. I I can't think of one that would cause the that sort of variation now. I'm going to throw it back to you, Charlie. I've asked my questions. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you, Keith, because Jeff, I know this is not a, a question that, that you want to take sides on. But um, but yeah, so we tested a bunch of instances across the three main public clouds. Uh, who won? So I think it's safe to say that it, from a performance perspective, um, or plus per performance perspective, there was at least one configuration in all three cloud providers that got you within our margin of error. Um, T2D was clearly the, the overall performance winner, and it was the price for performance um, winner as well, but it was still within the, from a price to performance perspective, it was still within the margin of error with some other instance types, all, all of which were also and the instance types with the exception of one, which was M6i. It is really unfortunate we didn't get to test M6a because of the cutoff time for this year's report. I expect oh, yeah. it would have um, it would have crushed. Uh, but uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what what that looks like for this this coming year's report. But um, so I would say T2D was kind of an outlier, right? Um, and then it would have been basically any current generation AMD instance, yeah. um, and then uh, Intel Ice Lake, and then kind of everything else. Um, and so, um, so for there wasn't really a clear winner from a cloud provider perspective, at least for for this. Um, the one spot, and, and this was kind of an interesting because of this, the interesting in insight that we had was. Um, everything kind of costs the same amount of money to run with the exception of one thing and that, well, two things really. One is storage and the other is network transport costs. Um, so all three providers offer really good mid-tier storage performance for block volumes and they're all pretty price competitive. So while that was a big portion of the cost of running each test, um, they were very comparable and that was included in that that Price, uh, price per transactions per minute calculation that we did, right? And that was, you know, we, we looked at monthly cost and if we needed to do say 10,000 transactions per minute, you know, what would the cost for each of those transactions be over the course of a month? Um, so, it, you know, it's kind of like a cubed thing but we didn't put the cube in it. Um, <laughs> but, um, cause it was already a really long acronym that nobody was gonna track anyway. Um, now, the one thing that surprised us and we uh, tripped us up during the cross region network tests was the um, um, that was by far the most expensive thing, like by like a long shot. Each yeah. individual database benchmark maybe cost us 15, 20 cents, depending on the instance type. Right. Uh, we ran up a $30,000 network transport bill in two hours uh, <laughs> just running peak throughput tests from the cloud providers to the point where Charlie will remember this, where we had got pinged by our like director of infrastructure who was like, Hey, did we get hacked? Uh, 
So um, no, I DOS attacked myself. Yes. No, uh, and the engineer um, uh, Jane, who 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 was working on that test, was like, "Did I do something wrong?" I'm like, no, it means that you did the test properly. Because yeah, you know, honestly, well, the budget. Yeah. So um, the the one thing that was interesting is based on, and if I were a CIO or a CTO, and I was picking a cloud provider, and I didn't already have a, a dog in this particular show, um, I would pick it based on the cross AZ and cross region uh, network transport costs for whatever region I was doing business in. Um, right. So um, Google in North America charges half as much as AWS and, um, G and um, uh, Microsoft. Um, but if you're in a different geography or if you're going cross continent, which we have a lot of customers that do that, um, you know, Microsoft wins in some regions and AWS wins in some regions and Google wins in some regions. And that would be, now that I know, I can say very confidently that I can get great performance and price performance characteristics out of whatever cloud provider I've picked amongst the big three. Um, I would use my location and what we were, what we were gonna get charged for moving data in and out of AZs and regions as the thing that I would use to decide which cloud provider I was going to get started with, right? Um, there are other things too, right? Like, because each of the providers have their their SaaS offerings that ride on top of that. I'm very intentionally just talking about renting server and storage and networking, right? So like- Yeah, to simplify the, the landscape here, right? Exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah, it, like, like you and I talked about it, it was, it was, it always came down to sort of the, that FinOps strategy, again, on your workload and, and really what your application is doing for you to finally land, as you're saying, these insights. Yeah, it makes sense to go here for this, but maybe um, I'm going cross content. I have to use uh, a, a different uh, topology, therefore another one might win. So it, it is an interesting uh, uh, thing that everyone has to go through. You know? Well, and what's really great about CockroachDB is you don't have to pick just one cloud provider, right? So pretty much every other database platform on the planet, you got to pick one and you got to ride with it. Whereas, um, you know, you can pick a different cloud provider in each region that you're in or each geography that you're in and and build a single globally consistent database using CockroachDB for it. So um, we have a, a the vast majority of our customers that are multi-continent are running also multi-cloud, right? Nice. Um, so uh, that's a really useful thing for us to be able to say it's like just pick the one that's the least expensive to operate and here is the configuration that we would recommend for running cockroach db so um in past years it wasn't as even it would have um it was harder for us to make this assertion but um but everybody's kind of caught up with one another in that regard um now with ttd of course that's a different kind of a different architecture yeah um and, and, but I would say because the cost performance was effectively like two or three tenths of a cent per transaction per minute per month, um, uh, difference, right. Um, you can still get really awesome price performance out of instances that are, that are kind of like just generally available. Um, and it's not that you couldn't use T2D in combination with an Azure instance or, or an AWS instance. It's just that it might be rate limited by the fact that it's working in a joint cluster with um, other infrastructure, right? So, sure. um, so if, you, if you had a kind of a more mixed topology, the, slow, the faster instances won't get as, um, won't necessarily get as, uh, get as close to their theoretical performance maximum because they're going to be waiting for other instances that maybe aren't quite as fast to, to right. respond. It's not that like all of a sudden they get slower. It's just that they might be waiting longer than they would otherwise be anticipating. Okay. Um, I am shocked by the we... way that we haven't gotten a single question from the chat. Absolutely. So I was shocked. actually just about to, about to pose one. Um, so we do have a question from, from Blake Anderson who, this is probably one for you, Jeff. Um, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'll just ask you so you have a chance to answer it directly. Um, the core mark score between Milan and Rome on GCP and our testing, uh, there's a big jump up in performance there on the new Milan chips. Um, so 
they're asking, is that better performance primarily just a factor of the node size or is there something architecturally in the chip that's different that's causing that performance jump? So, yeah, when you're looking at the, the core mark scores across all the different instances, when you're saying about like the T2D specifically, right? Like that was page, I wrote that down some like page seven, eight, nine, sort of in your, um, in your brief there. Um, it wasn't so much the, you know, a difference in the architecture for our instances, more that, as I was saying, it was, you know, a, a um, uh, SMT off core versus the threads. Uh, that that helped drive that. And all I was saying was uh, the other compare moving forward as the next uh, set of benchmarks happen uh, is running it on the, uh, for the other clouds like an M6A, which would be a like for like a Milan to Milan. Um, so that, cause you were running an earlier variant of that. But um, like I said, the, the closest two from the core marks would have been the N2D um, which was the threaded and the non-threaded, meaning uh, the T2D. So T2D, it's the same architecture. It's just a, a change uh, to, to take SMT off. So that's really, that's really the only difference. So I think T2D was the only instance that we tested that had, uh, you know, SMT uh, turned off. Are there other instances that we should have tested that have SMT turned off that, that maybe we didn't know about? No, that's the only one there um, that um, for the instances across the landscape of, of the cloud providers uh, in the today, uh, and there's a, um, but that's why I was saying is at least uh, to test uh, an M6A and the new release of R6A that came out on the, the other side, on the AWS side. So that would be the Milan sort of like for like, but um, those are all threaded to your point. So, um, yeah, this is the only one that is not, that's true. Got it. All right. We are uh, already getting close to time here, but I do have one question um, that I want to pose to you, Keith. And we were actually talking about this, um, uh, before the webinar kicked off. So the final report is I think 78 pages. Um, and by the way, it's free, please go download it. Uh, if you haven't done that, I'll make my little pitch there again. But uh, our first draft was uh, well over a hundred. Um, and the title of this webinar is sort of like the stuff that isn't in the cloud report. We've already discussed some of that. Um, but yeah, Keith, could you maybe just talk a little bit about what did we end up cutting and why? Yeah, we ended up cutting a lot of the storage benchmarks actually, and a lot of some of the like lower tier network benchmarks. Um, and we also didn't talk um, about a lot of some certain storage configurations as well to, to kind of make, make room. Um, generally speaking, there were kind of three things that we, we determined, right? Um, from a storage perspective, pick whatever the cheapest storage option is that meets your IOPS and disk throughput requirements for whatever your application is. And you're going to, that's going to be your best price performance. Um, we were going to have to go to scale really large nodes to need like the ultra disks and premium pre and like, um, and extreme PDs and IO2s of the world, um, yeah. which would probably surprise a lot of folks because we're a database. You'd think we'd be IO bound, but because we can scale out, we're, we're much more apt to scale out rather than trying to scale up. So that was kind of one of those things. Um, a lot of the storage benchmarks, we're talking about like storage, like tail latency and whatnot. Uh, didn't seem to have a lot of impact on the actual database benchmark. So we didn't include them, but um, the one spot where the, the super high-end storage was would potentially have, have been beneficial for folks is on the tail latency, like commit latency and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and um, because just because the architectures of all those, they, they respond faster, right? You just get um, faster write latency, for example but you don't get faster IOPS, you don't get more IOPS and you don't get faster throughput, it's just the tail latency. So if I was doing like an HPC type workload, I might really actually need the faster store, like the super premium storage, um, even if I didn't have a higher IOPS requirement, um, but we don't really, um, we don't have that in the database, right? Cause we're not considered with my, um, concerned with microseconds, for example. Uh, we're considered concerned with like, you know, 
you know, half a millisecond maybe, but we're not looking at tens of microseconds. Um, the other thing that, that kind of got cut from the report was a lot of the like the intra um, intra node uh, same AZ network stuff. Um, basically, because we didn't do any um, discrete node placement, our variation between runs was greater than our our floor. Uh, so um, so and the floor was like twenty microseconds. It was crazy low. So, um, so, and all three providers had a floor would be like cross node floor in the like 20 to 30 microseconds kind of a, a space, which is like insanely fast. So a microsecond is like a thousandth of a millisecond, just to give you another hundredth of a millisecond or something like that, just to give you an idea, like how ridiculously fast we're talking about here. Um, and so we didn't publish a lot of that information because we weren't confident that we didn't need to go back and redo um, redo those tests with uh, uh, discrete placement constraints turned on, right? So that where where we could say, hey, make sure you put all these instances in the same rack or something like that. Um, the um, the other thing that didn't make the report really at all um, was. Um, was some of the kind of like intermediate testing that we did to try to determine why the eight vCPU instances outperformed the 32 vCPU instances by a pretty large margin. So we did some, in past years, we've just tested 16 vCPU shapes. Um, they, um, we weren't able to run a full suite of 16 vCPU shapes, but we did do some kind of sample testing. Um, performance degradation um, seemed to be, um, um, as expected between eight and 16. And then it was a big jump down at 32. So that was part of the question around, you know, maybe there's some NUMA stuff happening in the background that we don't know about or something on those lines. Um, particularly considering we kept the configuration very, very uh, solid. We also did some, and we talk about this in the appendix a little bit, but we had, we had a bunch more written about how we did some scale out testing where we took um, cause we were doing the same number of nodes, but different varying vCPUs and then comparison of per doing a per core thing. Um, we also did some sample testing where, um, we took say like four 32 vCPU nodes and compared it to 16, eight vCPU nodes. So it was exactly the same number of core count. Um, and the, the smaller nodes still outperformed. Uh, it wasn't quite the same margin, right? It was a little less because we less, did have yeah. more network overhead and whatnot. Um, but the per vCPU performance was still very much in that, you know, it was definitely still very statistically significant, right? It was well above our 1.4% margin of error um, for, for all the database benchmarks. Do you know, um, Keith, what was like sort of the working set size that you guys were, were working on? I'm trying to think about that as well, uh, yeah. to triangulate. So so we tested a very variety of different working set sizes that were based on kind of the TPCC benchmark. Now I want to be clear: we did not run in a like a. a we used the TPCC queries and we used yeah. a TPCC harness. We did not run TPCC the way they would run TPCC for like a published run, right? So it's a derivative database, but we are using their schema and their data. and um, gotcha. so we had we had a fixed warehouse test at 1200 warehouses, which is like 40 gigs of data across the nodes. And then um, we had a varying one based on the number of vCPUs. And so we would do like, I think it was a 50 to 150 in 25 warehouse increments. So that puts your eight vCPUs at like 400 to 1200 and your 32 at like a thousand to like 4,000 or something like that. Right, right? yeah, um, makes so, sense. Um, what we saw pretty consistently is that uh, larger workloads degraded slightly because they had more complicated large queries. Um, exactly. <laughs> but, but it wasn't like a huge steep decline um, with the exception of like the nodes that had less than the four, VC, uh, four gigs of memory per vCPU. Those are the ones where we saw bigger performance degradation across as we kind of went to more complicated queries and more variation between runs as well. Yeah, that I can understand. That's that's pretty normal. Yeah, the, the yeah, fraction you get. 
And to be clear, we recommend four gigabytes of memory or more uh, per vCPU for running Cockroach TV. So it was good to confirm our production guidance. Uh, I, I was I was glad I didn't have to uh, go and ask somebody to revise that. Um, but um, <laughs> the it, but it was a very it was a pretty dramatic. Um, fall off, even with the micro benchmarks, which is where we were a little bit surprised. Uh, did yeah. that answer the question that you were going for there, Charlie? Yeah, I think so. Um, and actually, so we're, we're already over time here, so I, I do want to be respectful of folks' time. Um, I, I want to get a quick pitch in here um, just for everybody who's here. We're actually doing a, a customer conference this September 20th, 20th and 21st in New York. We're calling it Roach Fest. Um, and we've got a code on the screen here, Webinar 50, you can use to save on that um, if you want to come through. It's, it's going to be awesome, and there'll be a lot of insights on how to get the best out of using CockroachDB. Um, and I guess maybe maybe to play us out, Keith, there is one other question that's come up a few times uh, in, in the chat that, that we can answer before we hop off here, which is just um, Graviton instances. Are we going to see those maybe next year? Why weren't they in the report this year? Yeah, so um, in Pat, last year's report, we did some early ARM benchmarking prototypes. Um, the um, We were expecting to have kind of uh, GA ARM support for this year's report, but then we weren't quite ready yet. Um, and we didn't feel like it was fair to, well, anybody for us to go to compare um, our production supported and well-tuned um, database performance on AMD and Intel uh, versus uh, like, a, like a custom build that we were going to run on a developer's laptop uh, for the, for the ARM-based instances. Um, we, we are planning on having, um, now that most of the developers are running in one Max, uh, we are planning on having um, like uh, official ARM binaries later this year. Uh, I, I won't call out the exact date, um, but we do expect that that means that we'll be able to have a return of ARM for, for next year's report. Um, that'll be up to the team that actually does the, the benchmarking, as you know, Charlie, but uh, that's the reason why it wasn't in this year. Um, but uh, looking forward to seeing what that means for, for next year. Awesome. Uh, all right, thank you. And I guess, uh, Jeff, any any final thoughts from you or anything you want to share with folks uh, before we before we hop off here? Uh, no, just uh, looking forward to uh, uh, continued involvement uh, in the, the whole uh, experience we have here, and uh, looking forward to the next set of benchmarks for sure, and in, in our in our own future uh, roadmap. So it'll be 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 a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us, Jeff, and telling us why we saw some of the things we saw. That was I learned a bunch, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, same. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Jeff, for joining us.